First of all, thank you to Christina and the organizers of the conference. I am delighted to be in Kingston for the first time. Even more delighted not to be in Winnipeg, where I understand it's about to snow again. <laughs> again. OK. So it is a pleasure to speak about something that you are passionate about. And this has been my passion for the last three decades. So long before the age of the selfie, Canadian women photographers understood the power of self-representation and turned their lenses on themselves. Photographic technologies did not merely allow them to reproduce themselves visually. Instead, photography offered a comparatively accessible means of reconfiguring the self, despite constraining influences such as patriarchal expectations and discourses. Consequently, early Canadian women's photographic self-portraiture was a diverse practice. Some women used it to position themselves professionally, others to make contact with their communities and articulate aspects of their identities beyond the daily domestic routine. Examining a selection of self-portraits made by amateurs such as Annie McDougall and Maddie Gunterman, as well as professionals including Hannah Maynard, Edith Watson, and Geraldine Moody, my analysis employs concepts such as narrative and performance to consider how these women photographically image themselves. The criteria for the selection of these five photographers was based on presenting a sample of women's self-portraits from the period 1880 to 1920. All of these images are currently in Canadian photo collections and archives, and their makers are part of the established social history of photography in Canada. This paper explores these issues in four parts. First, it will provide a brief social historical context. Second, Gunterman and Maynard's self-portraits are examined as orchestrated chronicles. Third, Watson and Moody's images are read in relation to ideas of public self-representation as professional women. Finally, McDougall's more private self-portraits are considered in contrast to conventional representations of women of their time. Art historian Naomi Rosenblum seminal text, A History of Women Photographers, establishes a long relationship that women have had with photography since its introduction in 1839. One of the primary arguments developed in this study is that a diverse group of women all seized photography as a tool that gave them greater input into the life of their times. Arguably, a significant way in which these women had such agency is the fact that they were able to control their own public image. Thus, these photographers were indicative of the new woman who had a measure of control as to how the world views her. In her essay, Reflections on Self-Portraiture, feminist scholar Ina Lowenberg explains that women have a special incentive to make self-portraits. It allows them to represent themselves as subjects rather than objects. The early self-portraits made by women often represent a social context rather than merely an aesthetic one. They preferred to depict themselves as active productive members of community and family rather than being diminished as merely decorative. Much of the self-portraiture made was constructed as a narrative for the family photo album. Art historian Martha Langford considers the photography album to function as a pictorial aide memoir to the telling of stories. The camera thus made available to women a socially accepted form of self-representation that permitted them to author their own family narratives. Photographic portraits that feature gender construction as part of the performance of identity have existed since the 19th century. Francis Bozzero, who specializes in social history of art, argues that, quote, exploration of gender appears earlier in women's photographic self-portraiture than it does in versions 
that are painted where it has to wait till the 20th century. Evidence, end quote, evidence for this assertion is particularly present in Gunterman's self-portraits where she depicts the performance of gender in two self-portraits she created for her narrative. And you're seeing dressed for the masquerade ball, Maddie and Henry. Gunterman with her son, Henry, appear clad in feminine frills. Gunterman is attired in a white dress covered in lacy butterflies, and Henry is pictured as the girl child. Neither figure dominates in this image, both are equally decorative, although in quite different ways. This stereotypical ultra-feminine form of dressing is uncharacteristic of the pragmatic Gunterman. Thus, she appears to almost be as much of an impersonator of womanliness as her son. She appears to be masquerading as a kind of woman that in other of her self-portraits, she has taken great pains to resist. In Beaton, people dressed for the masquerade ball, she appears with friends Anne Williams and Rose Williams in costume for a party held in the town of Ferguson as a benefit for the Miners Hospital. The image is timeless and given the richness of its signage goes well beyond just being a visual document of a costume party. The fact that the creator and the photographer is a woman who appears in the frame disguised as a man, accompanied by two other women in costume, raises some significant images and asks some significant questions. Cross-dressing and masculine posing appears in women's self-portraiture as early as 1896 in photography in the works of the American photographers Alice Austin and Francis Benjamin Johnson. It is also evident in some of the portraits that Edith Watson made of herself and her friends. In the history of Canadian photography, using performative narrative in images is particularly evident in the work of Gunterman and Hannah Maynard. Between 1899 and 1911, Gunterman made numerous self-portraits. These album images chronicle her transition from an urban existence as a hotel maid in Seattle to the rough pioneer world of British Columbia where she was employed as a mining camp cook. Forced to move to Canada because of ill health, she used photography and specifically self-portraits to construct a new identity as a self-sufficient pioneer woman. The resultant images reveal how Gunterman's evolving relationship with nature and increasingly dominant position within her family reinforced her self-confidence. The images made on the journey to Canada both position the family symbolically within the landscape and record a transition between the urban past and the family's identity as frontier pioneers. Beyond this obvious meaning, though, a more detailed analysis shows them to exemplify Gunterman's use of the camera as a re recorder of self-created theatrical tableau, carefully staged, peopled, and when necessary, accessorized with the appropriate <coughs> costumes and props. This approach to making photographs was common in the professional studio. However, quite apart from having been made outdoors, Gunterman's images are far more complex, multi-layered, and personal than the conventional studio fair. Um, and the image of Maddie by the tree, somewhere along Columbia River, she poses with a tree butt, the case of her plate camera leaning against the tree's cut edge, as obviously conscious inclusion that identifies her as the photographer. Photo theorist John Tagg argues, quote, the portrait is a sign whose purpose is both the description of an individual and the inscription of a social identity, end quote. By choosing to photograph herself alone and apart from the family, this image confers the importance that Gunterman attributed to establishing a separate identity. 
By inserting herself within the frame, Gunterman establishes her position on the other side of the viewfinder, where she could be observed as a city dweller about to begin her journey into otherness, the wilderness landscape. This representation of women is rare in early Canadian landscape, where they are usually shown indoors, or if in landscape at all, only in parks and gardens, places that have been made safe through the careful application of civilization. The next image, Maddie, Will, and Henry Gunterman, Allison Pass, BC, 1902, depicts the household on the duty trail to Thompson's Landing. Presented as a theatrical tableau vivant, the form that was to become a leitmotif in her family portraits, Maddie is featured in front and slightly apart from her son Henry and her husband Will, who follow behind with rifle in hand and her conqueror's gaze fixed upon a future slightly beyond the photographic frame, Maddie assumes the pose of family matriarch. Under such leadership, the family is represented as highly capable in its quest in the rugged Canadian landscape. In her even more in formal imagery, Gunterman understood the significance of controlling the authorship of her own identity. In Nellie L. Mind, Rose Williams, and Maddie on the Stove, with Anne Williams, 1902, a lighthearted moment is shared between Gunterman and her co-workers in the context of their everyday environment. These three women are able to escape temporarily from their workplace routine by amusing themselves before Gunterman's camera. The resulting photograph, which appears spontaneous and even artless, a mere casual snapshot, is anything but. The image attests to Gunterman's skill as an advanced amateur photographer, able to facilitate the necessary exposure needed for the challenging interior subject through the use of flash powder. This unusual image transcends the more typical static documentation of women at the time, instead portraying a high-spirited comradeship of them as workers and colleagues. Examined together, Maddie's collection of self-portraits reflect her new identity in the Canadian West and show her developing self-awareness as a confident confident pioneer woman and a leader in her family unit. Another such strong woman was Hannah Maynard. Hannah not only introduced her husband to photography, but was in her own right one of the most prominent Canadian professional photographers of the period. She is the subject of considerable attention because of her eccentric photographic montages and her multiple self-exposed portraits. Feminist scholar Carol Williams argues that the novelty in Hannah's imagery led her to be trivialized in terms of her professional abilities as a photographer. Williams further notes that frontier environments allow women greater possibility to transgress convections of femininity and class, and this is apparent in Maynard's frontier photographs. She breaks from convention by often using a technique of multiple exposure. For example, self-portrait pouring tea shows three Hannahs, a visual pun depicting me, myself, and I. The first Hannah is a conservative Victorian lady pouring tea in an approved manner. The second looks straight into the lens her gaze directly meeting the spectator. And in the third version, Hannah, the wicked trickster, pours tea down upon the second Hannah's head. Photo researcher Laura Jones argues these images show another side to Hannah's work beyond the pictorial style popular in the day to depict a flair for experimentation and wit. Such humor is direct contrasting to the rather stuffy ritual tea party depicted in the other image 
made by William Notman of Miss Evans and Friends, Montreal, 1888. The latter image features a tea party whose participants are reduced to rather lifeless mannequins, particularly when contrasted with the spontane spontaneity and fun present in Hannah's image. Deborah Cherry points out that in making self-portraits, 19th century women wanted to be presented as professionals. This is certainly the case for Geraldine Moody and Edith Watson. Moody was a professional photographer from 1895 to 1898 who operated three studios in Western Canada. Her marriage to Northwest Mounted Police Officer J.D. Moody both enhanced her already privileged upper class status and gave her access to special opportunities to photograph, such as going into the north where she set up a studio on government ships. The earlier, um, one of the earliest Moody self-portraits is the image that you see um, on your left. The portrait was made in her studio in Battleford. At first glance, it bears a striking resemblance to the uh, well-known image by Francis Benjamin Johnson on the right. Johnson's well-known image satirizes the new woman and presents her uh, in a typically more masculine pose that um, underscores that she considered herself emancipated because she was a professional photographer. And the similarities between these images is probably uh, because of the pictorial styles that were popular during the time. Another portrait, slightly later of Moody, shows a more mature individual who is more comfortable with herself and before the camera. Uh, this is a staged, performed self-portrait that is created in Moody's studio. A still later self-portrait uh, is reminiscent of two things. The first is uh, Moody's rather striking and remarkable portraits of Inuit mothers, elsewhere I have analyzed this work. And the second is it is reminiscent of Maynard's preference for photographing her grandchildren. It is necessary to consider these images in contrast to uh, one of her male peers from the time, from the noted Topley studio in uh, Toronto. And it goes without saying that here Moody is depicted in a much more conventional manner, reflecting her social status in full profile, adorned in uh, the fashion of the day. Another professional, Edith Watson, was a freelance photographer who traveled across Canada in the mid um, 1890s. And there was only, unfortunately, one self-portrait in circulation. This is uh, an image of Watson presenting herself as the avid sportswoman. The focus of the image is shifted away from Watson's appearance and focuses on uh, the activity of sports fishing, thus confirming um, Watson herself as unconventional because this type of activity was unusual for women during this time period. And lastly, I'm just going to conclude with um, the images of Annie McDougall. Annie McDougall was also photographed by William Notman. And the more technically proficient image um, on the right side is the Notman photograph. The more interesting photograph on the left, which is more complex, a little less technically astute, is the image by McDougall. She studied with Notman um, during her time in Montreal. But what is um, even more intriguing and um, merits more study is her final image. And this is a interior, an example of gendered space 
This room of one's own serves as a self-portrait despite the fact its inhabitant was only present behind the camera. Her presence is obviously implied through the personal narrative that is inherent in the gendered space of her bedroom. In conclusion, clearly women in early Canadian photography embraced the self-portrait because it assisted in the creation of an independent voice. These self-portraits provided an alternative to the objectification of conventional studio portraiture, thus giving women more agency to resist conventional stereotyping. Thank you.